Well, hello, and thank you for joining us again. Uh, this is our School of the Bible class, uh, The Life of Christ, and we are going to pick up in Lesson 7. Um, now, I'll be referring here to your notes on the computer. This starts on, in your notes, on page 29. Um, so, let's pray, and then we'll begin. Our Father, we ask you to be with us now, and I pray that you will help us, Lord, to uh, just learn the things that you would have for us. I pray that you open our hearts and our understanding. And Father, we ask and pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my goal uh, here is to go through these as quickly as possible for your benefit so you don't have to spend a lot of time. I don't want to fly so fast through it that uh, you miss some things. I think most of your notes, uh, there, there are no blanks um, in your notes from what I can see, but I'm going to give you some extra things uh, to go along with this. And this will, if you want to jot these things down in your notes, uh, some of the things I'll mention, um, I think it will help you in your Bible study. So we're looking at here the first 30 years <clears throat> of Christ. Um, <clears throat> Starting here in your notes says, these are not the uh, emphasis of the gospel record, yet they are foundational to the rest of Christ's life and ministry. And, of course, Christ's life and ministry was approximately uh, from 5 B.C. Some people say 3, some people say 6 B.C. It's anywhere in that range to roughly uh, sometime in December of A.D. 26. Um, so, Roman number one, the expectation uh, there are three parts to this, and again, I'm just going to read what you have in your notes, but give you a little bit extra. He was announced to Mary. Now, think about this for a second. Uh, if he didn't announce this to Mary, uh, if the Lord didn't announce this to Mary, then Mary probably would have been pretty confused how she became uh, pregnant, um, how you know, her child was there, uh, because it was very clear that she did not know a man. So she was a virgin. And so uh, God, of course, in his mercy, announces to her. Uh, he also, uh, he was announced to Elizabeth. The coming Christ was announced to Elizabeth. Um, and this was to cause real worship and praise. And this is also proof that babes can hear in the womb. Uh, babies can hear in the womb because John the Baptist heard, as soon as he heard the salutation of Mary, he leaped in the womb. So, Letter C, he was announced to Joseph. Now, this is to explain to Joseph the cause of Mary's pregnancy. Um, so that was his expectation. <clears throat> now, Roman number two, the Emmanuel. Uh, there's several things we're going to look at here. He was born in Bethlehem. This was, first of all, to fulfill prophecy. And Bethlehem um, is actually the name is means the house of bread. So, Jesus Christ is the bread of life, and he came to the house of bread. Uh, he was also, letter B, he was visited by the shepherds. This was to identify with every class of society. The shepherds were uh, kind of the working class, and so this was to identify with every class of society, and the shepherds would be the lowest social class there. Um, let her see, he was circumcised. This was to tie him to the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, he was part of the covenant line. Letter D, he was presented in the temple. And of course, they give you uh, the passages there you can look at and, and uh, reference those. Uh, but I'm not going to uh, take time for those. I'm going to hit a button here and see if this helps with the lighting. I don't know. Um, that looks a little bit better, but I don't know why that's still, the video is still kind of zooming in and out, but we'll deal with it and, and move on. Um, <clears throat> so he was presented in the temple and this was to fulfill the law. He received the covenant sign and now was presented to God in reality. God was presenting Jesus to man and that's why he was presented in the temple. Uh, letter E, he was visited by the Magi. Now, question I always ask, um, ask you all, uh, how many wise men were there? Well, we just know there were at least two. 
uh, because it says wise men. Now, tradition says there were three because of the three gifts, but we really don't know. There could have been 20, 30, whatever. Could have been just two. Uh, there, there was a plural number of them. But he was visited by the Magi to receive gifts that were fitting for a king. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, a for, the foreshadowed gifts given in millennium uh, in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 11 and 12, and also in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. So this was, you know, kind of a foreshadowing those gifts. Now, the three gifts that they gave were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold was a gift for a king. Frankincense is a gift uh, it's kind of like an offering. It's what they would do. Um, they would burn that for their offering. Uh, and then myrrh is a gift for um, death. And the passages you can look at, I think they have there in your notes. So I'm comparing here on the screen your notes to my notes. Uh, letter F, he was taken to Egypt. And this was to spare his life. This was both to escape Herod's wrath and it was also a fulfillment of Scripture. Herod the Great's attack was another attempt by Satan to try to destroy the godly seed. Um, and, of course, the devil has been trying to destroy the godly seed ever since. Uh, Roman number three, the example to all young people. He returned to Nazareth. Okay, so this is the first thing. He returned to Nazareth. Now, why did he return to Nazareth? Well, for a few reasons. One, to grow up. Um, that was fulfillment of the scripture there in Matthew 2 that uh, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, Nazareth had a very bad reputation. It was a very evil, had a very evil reputation. Nazareth basically means uh, kind of like an offshoot of something. Uh, it's It was rejection. To be called a Nazarene was not a good thing. Um so that was kind of, uh, the Bible says he was to have a lowly birth and a humble birth. And of course that fits right in there with scripture. Scripture prophesied that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. Joseph did not settle in his hometown of Bethlehem because the bloodthirsty son of Herod the Great ruled there. Okay, letter B, <clears throat> he visited Jerusalem. Now, why did he do this? Well, he did it to attend a feast with his parents. This was at the age of 12. And other boys, other 12-year-old boys, uh, would be referred to as a child of the law. And that's what he became. Uh, this revealed his wisdom. Um, it showed also his early recognition that he knew who he was. He knew he was the Messiah. And letter C, he developed also as a young man. And this was to prepare him for his life's work. Many young people today don't realize uh, they're put in the homes they're put in, and they are uh, they go through the situations and circumstances of life they go through to prepare them for their life's work. They don't always, and we don't usually understand how uh, God can turn these you know bad situations. Hopefully, you know kids grow up in a good situation. But uh, he can use a good situation for his honor and glory, but he can also use a bad situation. Uh, young people don't understand how that's possible, but it is. Um, the Bible says that he grew uh, socially, he grew mentally, he grew physically, and he grew spiritually. So he grew in all these ways. <clears throat> And also, um, when we think about him growing socially, he had uh, four brothers and some sisters. James and Jude would later be saved, and they would write uh, books of the New Testament. Of course, the book of James and the book of Jude. All right, Roman number four, the establishment. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time as well. Uh Letter A, he was foretold by John the Baptist. Now, let me say this. If I go too fast here, uh, please feel free. You can back this up, and, and that's the nice thing about having it on YouTube, is you can go back and listen to it and pick up anything that I missed, or maybe you missed is writing down in your notes. So, But I am going to try to just go quickly. 
uh, for those uh, who would like to move on a little faster. Um, so he was foretold by John the Baptist. Now, <clears throat> this was to prepare the people. Six months before Jesus comes on the scene, John started preaching, and he would preach through his first years of ministry. Uh, then he was baptized, and this, the Bible tells us, was to fulfill all righteousness. This was done at uh, Bethabara on the upper Jordan. Um, this inaugurated his public ministry. Not long after John's voice was silenced, Jesus basically picks up his message. Um, and then it also identified uh, with us in a representative way, not as a sinner. The Father spoke from heaven to assure no confusion on this point, but to identify with sinners and with the ministry of repentance. And that's what the baptism was for, was to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance, to show it was an outward demonstration to show uh, there was a change that was taking place in them. And then let her see, he was tempted. <clears throat> um, this was to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The Lord felt things that you and I feel. He went through a lot of the same things uh, that we did. Uh, there were three temptations. Um in the three temptations, uh, it appealed to the three root sins. Now, the three root sins of life are the lust of the flesh, that's one. Uh, the lust of the eyes is the other, and the pride of life is the third. And those three temptations appeal to each one of those. Those three temptations all have an if in them. If thou be the Son of God. If, and it goes on and on. But they all have an if, and they were all answered the same way it is written. That's why it's important for us to know the Word of God. Even the devil used the Word of God in, I believe it was the last temptation, to uh, tempt Christ, and he, of course, pulled it out of Scripture, out of context. But the Lord each time said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And if we are going to do our jobs as Bible teachers, and uh, Bible students, then our job is always to point people back to Jesus Christ. Uh, even in our children, even in a Sunday school class, uh, we ought to always be pointing people uh, to Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move on here to lesson eight. So we are moving uh, quickly. I'm going to try to get as far as I can in these lessons. I think uh, there are 12 lessons. And I'm going to move quickly because there's one thing I want to cover a little bit more in detail. So um, <clears throat> this is the last years. Now, this is the first part uh, of this lesson. And the public ministry uh, of Jesus Christ, of course, let me see if they give you, they don't give you the Bible references. So let me give these to you. The public ministry of Jesus, uh, th these are basically... The beginnings. This is not all of it, obviously, but Matthew 4, verse 12, it begins there. Uh, Matthew 1, verse 14, through chapter 10, verse 52, um, that addresses a lot of his public ministry. Uh, a big part of Matthew, of course, deals with his public ministry. Luke chapter 3 through chapter 19, um, and chapter 19, it ends there at verse 27, that deals with a lot of his public ministry. And then the Gospel of John is basically towards the end of chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 35, through chapter 12 and verse 11. Now, this is approximately, uh, this covers about three to three and a half years. It's approximately December of AD 26 to April of AD 30. And it, there's a phrase found in John chapter 1, verse 29, and also 36. Um, and the phrase is, behold the Lamb of God. Um, so do you personally see Jesus coming? You know, we live in the world today with the pandemic and everything going on. And, and I still think to some extent, you know, this was, had been blown way out of proportion, but we still need, uh, there was a lot of things that weren't known about it, but I, I think the Lord has used this to try to wake Christians up. And whether it was blown out of proportion or whether it was you know, very real, I mean, 
Uh, obviously, if you get this, it's a very serious thing. Um, but uh, at least from what we know right now. But the thing is, I think God has used this time to try to wake us up and get us to uh, get more fervent about our prayer life and get more serious about realizing he is coming back and we need to see his coming. Okay, um, let's start here. A look at the beginning of his ministry. What John the Baptist said, I think I might be able to use read this without my glasses. What John the Baptist said about him. The way his public ministry began would set precedent for the rest of his ministry. Um, so we see room number one, Christ's first disciples. Uh, you had John the Baptist had reached Andrew and another disciple. Andrew would reach his brother, Simon Peter. And together they would go to Andrew and Simon City and reach Philip. Philip would then reach Nathaniel. And together they would all go to Nathaniel's hometown of Cana in Galilee. So Christ would be making disciples the rest of his life. Um, and that's what we're to do. And it usually is just one at a time, but you keep reaching disciples, and each one of them will reach others. Uh, Roman number two, Christ's first miracle. Now, this is, again, we're th talking here about the last years. Um, a definition of a miracle is something that cannot be accomplished by man's intellect or ability. Um, it is not natural but it is supernatural. That is a miracle. A miracle is not something that was just unexpected. Oh, it was a miracle. You know, sometimes we say that. Uh, just because it was unexpected doesn't mean it's a miracle. A miracle is something that was really supernatural. Um, and there were some crazy things that had to take place in order for these things to happen. Uh, and then you have the purpose of his first miracle. It was to reveal the glory of God. Now, his first miracle is recorded in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This was turning the water uh, to wine. This was also to cause uh, the people to believe in him. So he would work miracles the rest of his life, and every miracle would basically follow this pattern. It's going to reveal the glory of God and cause people to believe in him. Uh, Roman number three, Christ's first confrontation. He was angered over sin. He was motivated by the Father's glory. And he was bold in dealing with sinners. Uh, anytime in Scripture you see Christ dealing with his enemies, these things are true. He would deal with enemies the rest of his life. And if he had enemies, and we're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ you better mark it down. We're going to have enemies as well. We don't have to go looking for them. They'll find us. Uh, Row number four, and just making sure where we're at here in your notes, uh, Christ's first message. He gave a prophecy, and the prophecy was uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, this is right after his confrontation that he had, after he performed his first miracle. He declared his purpose here. His purpose, he lived to die, to live, to give life to dead men. Now, I think uh, he lived to die, to live. Yep, you have that in your notes as well. Uh, he lived to die, to live, to give life to dead men. You have all of his sermons, his discourses, his parables. These all would hinge on this one message. And his first message was the message of the gospel. And he would be teaching and preaching the rest of his life. <clears throat> and John chapter 7, verse 46, they said, Never man spake like this man. He spoke as one that had authority. And <clears throat> he spoke with boldness. Um, so taking a look at his teaching and preaching, in Matthew 4, 23, notice his public work broadly follows three channels. Uh, the preaching was the proclamation of the gospel. The teaching was the exposition of the gospel. That means he was expounding on it, explaining it to them. Um, the preaching was just, this is it, this is right, this is wrong. Teaching, he's explaining it. Healing is the illustration of the gospel. That's where people could see it come to life. Um, and you can read Matthew 4.23 on your own. I'm not going to take time to, to do that right now. Uh, some of the verses I will go through and look at, but not at this moment. All right, Roman number one, Christ's methods. 
um, he had the, what was, uh, has been called the language of life. It was, uh, his speech containing references to things that were easily identifiable to the people. Uh, it was a part of their everyday life. Um, he talked about things, uh, that were natural, like sun, light, fire, cloud, storm, rain, lightning, all that stuff. Uh, animate nature, um, he would use animals uh, in his illustrations and his parables, ox, sheep, camels, and so forth. Um, he would use plants as well. I talked about the olive tree, the sycamore, fig tree, uh, lilies, reeds, and thorns. And then let us see his human life. And just moving my way down the page here in your notes. Um, the physical, he dealt with that. He, that was the eye, ear, hands, hunger, thirst, sleep, sickness, all that. Uh, and I'm just checking here. Yes, you have all these things in your notes, so I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, the Number two, domestic, um, houses, lamp stuff. Commercial uh, would be uh, people who were builders, fishermen. Agriculture would be shepherds, soil, sowing. Uh, civil would dealt with taxes and robbery. Social would deal with marriage, hospitality. Religion would deal with uh, your giving, tithes and offerings, fasting, prayer, uh, the temple. Uh, historical uh, references to men of the past. Uh, so he would have all of these things. Now, how did he teach? Now, this is not in your notes, okay? How did he teach? Well, there's 12 things um, how he taught. And <clears throat> years ago, when I was in Bible college, uh, as we studied the sermons of Christ, there was something very similar to him. He would state, illustrate, and then apply. And I always remembered that. And if you have that when you're teaching the Word of God or you're trying to help somebody else, state the truth. Say, here's what the Bible says. State the truth. Illustrate it. Give a picture you know, uh, something that they can relate to, which is what he did, uh, and then apply it. This is how you can use it today. So you stated the truth, you've given an illustration so they can picture the truth, but then you applied it to their everyday life. And uh, this is a good rule of thumb. I try to do this in my preaching uh, and my teaching, but this is just a good rule of thumb to follow. Um, so how did he teach? There's 12 things here. Let me just go down through and read these. You can back this up and listen to it again if you want to. Uh, I'm going to give you the scripture references with it as well. So it's going to go kind of quickly here. Number one, with originality. Uh, that is in Matthew 5, verse 22, 28, 32, 34, 39, and 44. And also chapter 7, verse 28. Christ was a voice, not an echo. Uh, number two, he taught with simplicity. Matthew 6, 24. Simplicity must not be mistaken for shallowness. Uh, some preachers, uh, they when they're trying to keep it simple, really it's just shallow preaching. It's not. It's nothing but milk all the time. You need to have some meat in your preaching, but you need... Uh, or your teaching, either one. Um, you need to have some meat. You need to have some milk. But it needs to be simple. Try to keep it as simple as possible, not shallow. Uh, number three, with profoundness. He taught with profoundness. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 47. Mark 6, verse 2. Matthew 13, verse 54. Um, this this is uh, profoundness is right next to wisdom. He taught with a lot of wisdom. Um, <clears throat> he taught with pointedness. Uh, it was compact, but not obscure. It was crisp sentences which stick like burrs in the wind. In other words, he used his words wisely. Uh, no scripture references there for that. Uh, number five, with... Uh, and I'm just reading the notes here, picturesqueness. <laughs> you might need to look that one up. Uh, that's a, a new word to me. Picturesqueness. Um, figures, similes, and 
uh, other things like that. And then number six, with concreteness, it was not abstract. He embodied principles and example. Uh, and with no, number four, five, and six, didn't have any scripture references with them. Number seven, with contrast, um, so Matthew 11, verses 16 through 19, uh, Jewish people like children playing in the street. Um, so that was a contrast there. Uh, number eight, with practicality. And he always insisted on doing, which is a being obedient. Um, and I think the reason why is because if we love him, what are we supposed to do? Obey. Uh, so it was always, it was very practical and our teaching and preaching of the Bible, our reading the Bible, we ought to always come out of it with something practical. What can we do with this? Number nine with brevity, Matthew 13, 33, um, the marvels of compression yet clear and complete short, but full. That's what it means to be brief. Uh, and number 10 with authoritativeness, Matthew 7, 29. Uh, he never made guesses. He was very definite. Number 11 with universality. He says, I am the light of the world. I will draw all men unto me. Those are absolute statements. Uh, those are universal statements. That's what that means. Um, and then lastly, number 12, with finality, John 12 and verse 48. Um, <clears throat> so we're under an obligation we cannot escape from. Um, so he taught with finality. All right, now back into your notes. Uh, we are on page 33, Christ's Sermons, number two. Uh, there were about 45 discourses. <clears throat> And Matthew and John are distinctively the books of discourses. Uh, three important and very familiar sermons. Uh, let's see here. First of all, there's a Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew's 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters. Those dealt with character and conduct. Then you have the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And I'm going to go ahead and turn there because uh, we're going to look at maybe some of those verses here. Matthew 24, 25, and also Luke 21. And this was, the subject here was prophetic. Um, this is Christ. The Olivet Discourse is Christ's uh, great discourse on prophetic truth. Now, there are, this is a big word here, hermeneutical principles. Um they deal with Israel and not the church. So we need to make sure that we understand that when we're reading these things. Uh, this is related to Israel. They also, the events occur during Daniel's 70th week. Now, I've taught on this before uh, when we went through Revelation and we hit on you know, the seals and all that stuff. Uh, the events occur during Daniel's 70th week. Uh, which is Daniel chapter 9, and that is the tribulation time, that seven-year period of tribulation. Uh, the disciples ask a question, when shall these things be? Well, the question is answered most clearly in Luke 21 and verses 20 through 24. So let me read that. I'm in Matthew 24. If you want to turn in Matthew with me, you can. But uh, Matthew, or Luke 21 and verse 20 uh, through 24. And again, if you're watching this and you're not a part of the School of the Bible, this is mainly just for those folks that are in our class. Uh, I'm glad you can watch, but this is just so they can complete their notebooks here. And the writing's a little small, so I'm going to have to get my glasses. So Luke 21 and verse 20 through 24 says, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let, let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon his people. 
and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that gives a, the, a very clear indication of the timing of this prophecy. Now, all of this rests on Old Testament prophecy. So if you were going to write down an outline of <clears throat> this period of time, I'm going to give you a very general basic outline. Uh, Roman number one, you would have the tribulation period. This would be from Matthew 24, verses 4 through 26. And then you would have letter A, and again, I know I'm going quickly here. Um, letter A, you would have the first part of the tribulation. This would be covered in uh, roughly verses uh, 4 through 8. Um, in verse 5, you would have the imitation Christ mentioned. It says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Then you shall have war, in verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then you will have famine, in verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So you have famine, the pestilences and earthquakes, all of that. And then it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Um, verse 9 says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So you're going to have martyrdom. Now, these things are paralleled by the first five of the six seals in Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 11. So when we went through Revelation before, uh, we talked about that. Now, the second part of the tribulation, the last part of the tribulation, the last three and a half years, uh, basically is covered in from verses 9, um, part of verse 9 down through verse 26. You have in verses 9 through 11, I'm not going to read all these verses, uh, the period of persecution this is called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Uh, you have false religious leaders, um, verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now, let me say this, speaking of these times, the time in which we live right now, we see some of these things happening. But what we see happening today are just kind of like the precursor. They're just leading up to what's really going to take place. So, I mean, it's going to be on a grand scale uh, during this seven-year period of time. Right now, we're seeing a lot of little things leading up to it. And, um, you know, they're going to be abnormal to us, but I don't know that they will be so abnormal then because it's going to be more common Uh and people probably just, most people we know are not going to believe. There's going to be a lot of people saved during that time, but there's going to be a lot of people who's going to reject the truth. So they're just going to be like, ah, no big deal. Uh, this has happened before. Um, but anyway, as we move on here, uh, verse 14 talks about world evangelism. The gospel shall be preached in all the world. Uh, verse 17 through 20, the persecution of Israel. Uh, verse 29, there are disturbances of the heavens. Verse 30, there is divine judgment. Verse 38 through 39, um, you have a very materialistic philosophy, which people today, again, are living under. We're seeing all of the beginnings of these things. Now, that was all under room number one, room number two. These are all very brief things here. Uh, you have the second advent of Christ. That's in Matthew 24, verses 27 through 31, the second advent of Christ. Roman number three, you have practical exhortations. Um, that's chapter 24, verses 32 through 51. And then you have the judgment of Israel in chapter 25, verses 1 through 30. And then you have the judgment of the Gentile nations in chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. So, that's kind of a, a brief outline there of the Olivet Discourse. The third sermon is the Upper Room Discourse, mentioned in John chapter 13 through chapter 17. And chapter 17, of course, is a prayer. 
this is looking forward. It emphasizes the ministry of the Holy Ghost. And it's an anticipation of what is to come. And let's see here. Let's go ahead. We're going to be close to wrapping up here, I think. Uh, we're just going to try to do two lessons at a time, just for time's sake. Uh, Christ's parables, Roman number three, and <clears throat> his chief method of teaching uh, is using parables. Uh, and we, you can look at uh, Matthew 13, verses 10 through 17. Um, there are many parabolic illustrations in addition to the actual parables. He did not speak in parables until the middle of his Galilean ministry. That was his second year. Um, but uh, let's see here. Distinguish, they distinguish between interpretation and application. And I'm looking here in your notes. I'm just make sure I'm not leaving anything out here for you. Um, so the interpretation, um, is the original intent, intent, uh, then you have the occasion and circumstance, and then you have, when you interpret these parables, it's dispensational and prophetic. Uh, so you have to look at the parables that way. Uh, you have to follow some principles of interpretation. And of course we get those from the scripture. They give you, uh, Matthew 13 verses 18 through 23. In verse 36 through 43, uh, as mentioned there in your notes. <clears throat> and something to remember is when it comes to the Word of God, there is only one primary interpretation. Now, some people say, well, that's the way you interpret it. That's wrong. It doesn't matter how I interpret it. It doesn't matter how you interpret it. There's only one primary interpretation if we are looking at Scriptures correctly. That's why we must make sure we are rightly dividing the Word of Truth. However, there are many applications, many applications. Uh, so you, if you do not interpret the passage correctly, and then you try to make an application, your application is going to be wrong. Your application, if it's going to be correct, has to be based on a correct interpretation. Uh, I had somebody come to my office, and they did the right thing. You know, they had a problem with something I was doing, and uh, they said, you know, I just don't, I don't believe what you're doing is correct. Uh, and it's really bothered me. I prayed about it and they, they brought scripture, which was good. And I, and I didn't offend me at all, uh, when, when this happened, but they brought some scripture and, and, you know, cause they wanted to sit down and talk with me. So they read the scripture and then they said, now to me, this means, and then they started applying it, but here's where they were wrong. Um, and I told him, I said, now I, I appreciate you sharing your heart with me. But let me say this, there's only one correct interpretation of scripture. There are many ways you can apply the scripture, but if you're going to apply it correctly, you need to apply it based on a proper interpretation. And what they were doing was not interpreting it correctly, so their application was way off. And that's where we had a disagreement. Um, now, I don't know if the time, because they were still a fairly young Christian, I don't know if they fully understood all that. Uh, and we may at the time just have disagreed, um, but I tried to explain it to him as best I could. But here's some rules. Let me give you some rules for interpreting parables. Uh, a parable means to cast alongside, uh, and it appears about 50 times in the Synoptic Gospels. So here are some rules. One, parables teach central truths. Um, in other words, you know, they're just, it's going to teach something that's very uh, basic. Number two, determine how much is interpreted by the Lord himself. Number three, look for clues in the context as to the parable's meaning. An um, example of that would be in Luke 15. Number four, compare the parable with any Old Testament, uh, any possible Old Testament association or New Testament parallel accounts. Number five, do not use a parable as the whole basis for teaching a specific doctrine. Those are some pretty good rules to follow when it comes to uh, parables. All right, we're going to stop there. That's been close to 40 minutes. We're going to stop, I think, 40 minutes. Uh, stop, and I'll give you a break. I'm going to take a break, and then we'll pick back up. That was lesson seven and eight, and we will uh, try to get through lesson nine and ten. Uh, we've only got four lessons left in this particular class, the life of Christ. 
Well, God bless you and thank you for watching.